Good day, Dr. Ron here with a cybersecurity update for September 10th. And we've got a few interesting items to go over today. Again, my presentations are for my students as well as other learners of cybersecurity, just to keep everyone up to date. Uh, notes about the presentation. I'm not going to formally edit everything. I might cut out these gaps that I have, just so you know. Uh, this is for educational and training purposes. Feel free to share. Like uh, the information if you do. Send me a comment. Send notes. Also, if you want to subscribe, optional. It'll notify you of any updates. I had initially planned on doing these once a week. It looks like with the volume of incidents, I'll probably end up doing this twice a week to keep everyone up to date on what's going on with cybersecurity. I do provide the links to my references. Nothing is like secret, hidden, uh, confidential in nature. It's all publicly available information. Just a collection here that you can see what's going on in the cybersecurity world. My focus is to support your learning, so let me know if you need any other information or other questions do surface. Uh, again, uh, not as polished of a presentation. I'm just an educator. I also work full-time in cybersecurity, so a combo of those type of things as well. Let's see. We've got seven topics today. Cisco releases security patches for new vulnerabilities. A few items need patching. Uh, we'll talk about that. Microsoft warns of ransomware attack by Iranian, a group called Phosphorus. Third is Chinese hackers target government officials in Europe, South America, and Middle East. Fourth is hackers repeatedly targeting financial services of the French-speaking African countries. Fifth, CISA to formally solicit industry feedback on cybersecurity incident reporting rules. Sixth, almost half of educational institutions had a cloud-based cyber attack. And seventh, Shopify fails to prevent known breached passwords. So first off the bat, Cisco releases security patches for new vulnerabilities impacting multiple products. And Cisco on Wednesday, 9-7, rolled out three patches to three security flaws. And it included uh, weaknesses in the NVIDIA data plane development kit. Anyway, that software development kit is something a, a developer would use uh, to develop their own software. So this is a software supply chain attack very much like we have seen in the past year with SolarWinds as an example. Now this was tracked to CVE 2022-28199 CVE and look at that score, CVS a score of 8.6. Now if you look at the National Vulnerability Database, that's where you get all of the this intel about uh, these vulnerabilities. Yes, an attacker can also look at these databases and in one way, we talk about this in our CEH class, in one way you can use that as a recon area. So if you're an attacker and you can scan and discover what kind of devices a company has on their network and you can probably even scan depending on how that network's protected, what kind of software implementation and versions they have, then go over to the CVSS, uh, National Vulnerability Database, look at those what's vulnerable and as you as an attacker can dis determine what uh, types of tools techniques that you can use to attack that particular organization that is a good part of recon that we need to be aware of as defenders of networks anyway uh, this is a software supply chain attack uh, i'm reading this quote down below if an error condition is observed on the device interface the device may either reload or fail to receive traffic both are issues if you're looking at security we need to make sure we know in terms of a software world or even networking what those devices are doing the communication is really important so this could lead to a denial of the service a dos condition uh, this is all as a result and i'm looking back at the middle portion it's a lack of proper error handling in the dbdk's network stack again this is a vulnerability now it has a patch cisco also noted uh, that is, DPDK refers to a set of libraries and optimized network interface card drivers. So we've got these components, and if you're dealing with that as a part of the software stack, it uh, is essential that you re reload and repatch uh, these items down here. Now the devices in the Cisco lineup include the Cisco Catalyst 8000 V Edge software, the Adaptive Sur Security Virtual Appliance, the ASA, now in uh, the Cisco CCNA security, CCNP security courses, we talk about the ASA devices as well. Uh, Secure Firewall Threat Defense Virtual, FTD uh, version, if you will. So we'll go ahead and uh, patch those. Second item, Microsoft warns of ransomware attacks by Iranian 
Phosphorus Hacking Group. I love a lot of these names in here. It's very creative. We'll see many more names in this presentation. So Microsoft's Threat Intelligence Division on Wednesday assessed that a subgroup of the Iranian threat actor tracked as phosphorus is conducting ransomware attacks as a i love this quote i put it in high, uh, italics here a form of moonlighting for personal gain so interesting <laughs> that's a, a side hustle i don't know the side hustle that i would encourage is protecting networks anyway the tech giant which is monitoring the activity clustered under the moniker of dev 0270 aka nemesis kitten Again, the, love the names, said it's operated by a company that functions under the public aliases of Secnard and LifeWeb, citing infrastructure overlaps between the group and the two organizations. So you've got this essentially a state-sponsored groups. There's, there's clusters of, you can almost look at them as departments with different names, overlapping functionalities. And we talked about this as uh, state-sponsored organizations in one of our prior discussions, like with the Chinese government. And by the way, the Chinese government, their overall cybersecurity army is larger than our United States active Marine Corps by tens of thousands. So anyway, getting back to Microsoft, Dev270 leverages exploits for high severity vulnerabilities to gain access to devices and is known for the early adoption of newly disclosed vulnerabilities, Microsoft said. Now, uh, this comes into the domain and a conversation that we'll have specifically on uh, zero trust, zero trust architecture, where in essence, internally uh, with zero trust, we don't really trust any kind of traffic, any kind of communication within the network. We verify everything and certainly externally as well. So zero trust architecture involves software and hardware. We'll get into the details of that, but this speaks to the need for that. Dev270 also extensively used living off the land binaries, LOL bins. So we will talk about that in an upcoming video as well throughout the attack chain for discovery and credential access. So living off the land binaries. This extends to its abuse of the built-in BitLocker tool. They used a BitLocker and disk cryptor by Iranian actors for opportunistic ransomware attacks came to light earlier this May when secure work disclosed a set of intrusion mounted by the threat group. In other words, they also call themselves Cobalt Illusion and Tunnel Vision. I like kind of like that name, Tunnel Vision, because in a way it speaks to the use of BitLocker and disk cryptor simultaneously and, and getting back to how they're doing this, they're actually leveraging Microsoft's own tool uh, with Descriptor to, comp to a compromised device to lock up that device. An interesting approach. And we'll talk about LOL bins in a future uh, conversation. The next up is Chinese hackers target government officials in Europe, South America, and the Middle East. Again, China as a nation state has a large cyber security attack army, if you will. So the Chinese hacking group has been attributed to a new campaign aimed at infecting government officials. The way that's reading, it's infecting government officials computers, I would say, and devices in Europe, the Middle East, and South America with a modular malware known as Plug X. Now, I'll describe what Plug X is in just a second. So, and also there have been variants as of late as well. So, Plug X is a, um, down at the bottom, I put a definition here. Plug X is a modular piece of software that contains command and control. We've talked about command and control servers before uh, for tasking and can download additional plugins to enhance its capability beyond the basic information gathering. So once command and control is established in the victim's hardware, that uh, command and control can pull down additional software as needed. Cybersecurity Secure Work said it identified the intrusions in both June and July, and once again demonstrating the adversaries uh, group continue to focus on espionage against governments around the world, and in particular in Europe, South America, and the Middle East. A few more names on this slide. Bronze President is a China-based threat actor active since at least July 2018 and is likely estimated to be a state-sponsored group. So this is aside from the very large Chinese cybersecurity army that they have. They will sponsor multiple groups. They do sponsor multiple groups, which extends their reach 
much beyond what their 180,000 uh, person cybersecurity army can and does do, 180,000 plus. It's also publicly documented under other such names as, again, distribute the wealth, Honey Mite, Mustang Panda, Red Lich, and Temp Hex, Temp.Hex other groups that are sponsored. One of its primary tools of choice, again, the Plug X, uh, a remote access Trojan, again, with the command and control, has been widely shared among these adversarial collectives, adversarial groups. And I guess you could call it a collective because it could be a highly distributed group that is spread around the world, for example. So earlier this year, the group was observed also targeting Russian government officials with updated versions of the Plug X and that updated version is called Hadour, as well as entities located in Asia, European Union, and the U.S. So China is not on one side or uh, the other. I think in the, our media, we're sort of led to believe that you're either on the west side or the east side. I think China is just really out for themselves. So SecureWorks attribution for the latest campaign to bronze president stems from the use of Plug X. So in other words, SecureWorks has been looking at where Plug X is, since it originated from the bronze president, they can kind of follow that trajectory around the world. The attack chains distribute RAR archive files. Now, we talk about the different ways of compressing files. RAR is one uh, way, if you will, one uh, process uh, that contain Windows shortcut, the dot link, the link, the shortcut files, the dot link, file masquerading as a PDF document, opening that dot link that looks like a PDF, uh, executes a legitimate file present in a nested hidden folder embedded within the archive. So that's a mouthful. So bottom line is you click on a, the dot link file, which is mimicking a PDF file. Bottom line is it gets down to a folder that contains the attack uh, software. That process then paves the way for dropping a decoy document while the plug X payload sets up a persistence on the infected host. In other words, that persistence is the connection, the command and control. So bronze president has demonstrated an ability to pivot quickly for new intelligence collection opportunities. That pivoting is that command and control connection. So that is very robust and changes are rapidly deployed. Organizations in geographic regions of interest to China, I'm saying it's worldwide, should closely monitor this group's activities, the bronze president activities, especially organizations associated with or operating as government agencies. So what this is saying in terms of the warning is if you're a quasi-government, a government agency, you're going to have the bronze president and or all of their variants, the distributed control after you. So this is one area that you need to plug up. Next, we have hackers repeatedly targeting financial services in French-speaking African countries. So major financial and insurance companies located in French-speaking nations in Africa have been targeted over the past few years as a part of a persistent malicious campaign codenamed Dangerous Savannah. Countries targeted include the Ivory Coast, Morocco, Cameroon, Senegal, and Togo with a spear phishing attack uh, in recent months. Now, this was has been documented by the Israeli cybersecurity firm Checkpoint. Now, the infection entails targeting employees of financial institutions, well, it's a kind of a broader base, with social engineering messages containing malicious attachments. Again, Know where your attachments are coming from and ensure you've got uh, protection against those type of attachments, virus protection. The employees of financial institutions are receiving messages containing malicious attachments as a way to initially and ultimately lead to the deployment of off-the-shelf malware. Now, in our cybersecurity, our forensics course, as well as the ethical hacking course, we talk about several off-the-shelf malware tools. Metasploit is one of them, so they use Metasploit. Posh C2, we talk about that. DW Service and AsyncRat, we also talk about that as well. They're, what this organization is using are these off-the-shelf malware. They're very, using it in a very creative way. The threat actor's creativity is on display as this warning reads uh, in the initial infection stage. And again, they're using uh, the dot .link file types, the ISO, JAR, and VBE uh, type file types in various combinations to launch their attacks. The phishing emails are written in French and they use email 
I'm sorry, use Gmail and Hotmail services as the messages also impersonate other financial institutions in Africa to boost their credibility. So we've seen that in different venues. Uh, the attacks started in 2021. They leveraged macro-laced Microsoft Word documents. And uh, when those documents were then blocked by a lot, a lot of providers, a lot of uh, organizations, Dangerous Savannah then switched their tactics to PDF and ISO files. And that kind of pivot is very normal. So if you're defending networks, be prepared. Furthermore, the first wave of, of attacks, which started in 2020 and also at the beginning of 2021, involved the use of, use of Bespoke, which is a .NET based tools, which came disguised as PDF files attached to phishing emails to retrieve next stage droppers. Again, we talk about droppers, the command and control, the lo loaders from remote servers, uh, if you will. Regardless of the methods used, so we have now a variety of methods, post-exploitation activities carried out after obtaining an initial fo foothold, so once they get into a system, include establishing persistence, that command and control, performing additional reconnaissance, and delivering additional payloads to remotely controlled the host. It kills the anti-malware process and also kills logging and also does sets up a a key logger as part of the attack that's going on. <laughs> Interesting. So you get you get the whole bailiwick here with this. It's not known exactly where the threat actors are coming from, but the way their attack methodology is demonstrates their knowledge of open source software and also their tactics of maximizing financial gain is important to note. Quote, if one infection chain didn't work out, they changed the attachment and the lore and Try targeting the same company again and again to find an entry point. So persistence. Again, we got a uh, graphic right here that shows the phishing email as an attachment, a decoy document. It drops a link into the startup folder, runs on the startup or login. A command is executed, runs a PowerShell. The PowerShell then launches Posh C2, command and control. Posh C2 links to the Posh C2 server, receives more information down. Again, when this lineup wasn't effective they may have changed out the the document to a pdf etc interesting approach this one's interesting to study in terms of uh, both uh, digital forensics as well as the certified ethical hacker now CISA to formally solicit industry feedback on cybersecurity incident reporting rules again um, what is happening in the government is really kind of a conflagration of many things. Incident reporting, incident response plans have been all over the board. It depends on what type of data you're hosting as uh, an organization. If you're working with a DOD, the D DIBNET, Defense Industrial Base, things got kind of out of line, out of sync in terms of incident reporting. So um, President Biden in March signed uh, um, uh, incident reporting rules that CISA is now trying to vet out, trying to iron out in order to get some clarity in a broader based context than what has happened before. So CISA said, has said it use the reports to rapidly deploy resources and victims under attack and share information with network defenders. That's their quote. But what really kind of functionally happens is that if you do report an incident to, let's say, the DIBnet, how that process generally works is the FBI, Secret Service, other uh, DOD organizations do get involved with that reporting, figure it out. If it's a new kind of attack, they'll set it up in the, on the National Vulnerability Database as one of the vectors, attack vectors. If you're using as an organization uh, the National Vulnerability Database to pull off intel, which many do now, uh, you will get those CVE scores and it, it, it might flag that you have this type of server or this type of device that is noted on uh, the vulnerability database, you better darn well fix it. So that's kind of the communication chain. CISA's going to iron that out. It's been a little bumpy, a little rocky. So they're going to iron that out. They're going to solicit industry feedback. Here's a couple of quotes. This will finally allow us to much better understand what's going on across the ecosystem. Again, it was 
not very consistent. Secondly, we don't want to burden the industry and we don't want to burden the federal government. I think initially they probably will burden the industry just to gather information and they probably burden the federal government just to iron out things. But once the pipelines are established, having a broad-based incident response, incident reporting plan for the uh, uh, whole United States is really pretty critical. Again, their target is 72 hours once an incident is discovered. Now, I like this quote, while cyber offensives now I like this quote, while offensive cybersecurity is sexy, CISA wants cyber defenders like us to understand that defense is the new offense. Next, we've talked about educational institutions in the past few updates. So almost half of the educational institutions had cloud-based cyber attacks. So NetRex on Tuesday published a report that said 47% of educational institute, institutions suffered a cyber attack in their cloud infrastructure. So while we can button up our own locally hosted environment reasonably well, we use secure architecture, uh, throwing things out in the cloud adds another level of risks. So 47% of educational institutions that used cloud infrastructures suffered an, an attack. That's in the last year. The survey included, I want to point out something in the third bullet down, for 27% of the attacks, uh, that's 27% of the 47%, by the way, a quarter of those who have been attacked uh, under cloud security were associated with unplanned expenses to fix security gaps. I was a little confused by that because uh, it does that mean the other almost 75% had a budget plan for fixing security gaps? So sometimes the statistics don't make sense. <laughs> so anyway, uh, bottom line is when you do run into a cybersecurity incident, it's going to cost you uh, the time, materials, and effort, and it may be an unplanned expense. So um, the bottom line is this last bullet here. We'll talk about other items in the next slide. Educational institutions expect to have 56% of their workloads in the cloud by the end of 2023 compared with this year's 44%. So we're seeing an uptick by 22%. And again, if 47% are receiving attacks in the cloud, we're just expanding uh, the attack vector by dumping more into the cloud. And this calls for more secure uh, cloud for example, the CCSP. So almost half of it and institutions, here's a few quotes, but without proper visibility into who has access to sensitive data and when and how that data is being used, IT teams will not be able to proactively mitigate data exposure and spot suspicious behavior in the cloud. Now that's kind of a word salad of a quote. The bottom line is you need to know what kind of data you have, is it intellectual property? Is it PII? Is it some other sensitive data? Where it is now in the current infrastructure, and if you're going to put it out in the cloud, where is it in the cloud? What is security? What is the security posture of that cloud organization? Is that data encrypted? What is the risk value of that data? So that kind of analysis is not being done in the educational realm. And quite frankly, education in general, I know of the school district here and even the university they're stripped pretty thin so you don't have that really thorough analysis going on at large if you will second one educational institutions pose large volumes of sensitive student data and unfortunately most security solutions used by school districts were designed to protect on-prem data again getting to my earlier point we can secure on-prem data pretty well layered architecture mfa etc but once we throw it out once we shovel it out if we don't know what kind of data we're dealing with nor the security posture of the organization we're throwing our data over the wall and honestly it's still our responsibility as a school district as a university schools are ill-equipped to account for apps that reside in the cloud or student data that lives and travels on mobile devices hotspots and throughout the internet. Again, that opens up a whole new can of worms. In prior conversations, we've talked about um, on, on secure wireless, and we've talked about the use of cell phones and other mobile devices, including you know, USB drives. They're all very unsecure or insecure, uh, subject to attacks, etc. How do you isolate your network, especially if you interject uh, the cloud into the whole environment? Stay tuned, we'll continue to talk about these. Anyway, a few other schools are attractive targets uh, and are often an entry point for threat actors into state, county, and local governments. So what this bullet is saying, uh, it's often a pivot point. 
Secondly, educational institutions have been used as the stepping stones or ladder steps to ultimately reach other governmental targets. And third, too many educational institutions don't have the funds and expertise and the recommendations. Here's kind of interesting recommendations. All of us in cybersecurity should volunteer our free time to help educational institutions uh, develop best practices, help them follow uh, these steps to tighten day-to-day -day cybersecurity, and also put together and regularly update incident response plan, incident response plans uh, that institutions can act immediately. The bottom line, it really relates to resources and the funding. And if you're looking for a great career, uh, again, I feel like an advertiser, but there's over 750,000 open jobs in cybersecurity at this very moment. We're all very stripped, we're run out, uh, we're used and abused, and I, I love my job. So I just will leave it at that, where the resources, the recommendations are a wonderful notion. I don't know if we can practically do it yet, but uh, we'll, still, we'll still press forward with that. Anyway, moving on, this is Shopify. I think Shopify's, Shopify's a great company. They just kind of dropped the ball here. Shopify fails to prevent known breached passwords. A recent report revealed that e-commerce Shopify uh, uses particularly weak password policies on the customer-facing facing portion of its website. According to the report, Shopify requires its customer to use a password that is at least five characters in length. I didn't know that. I, I do have a Shopify account, but if on any uh, accounts I, I use this ungodly lengthy, and plus I also use a, um, a password manager as well. So uh, anyway, their requirement is five characters in length. And it does not begin uh, with or end with a space. You know, five characters, pretty short. According to the report, uh, researchers analyzed a list of a billion passwords. Uh, that were known to have been breached and found that 99.7 of those passwords adhere to Shopify's requirements. Five characters? I, I guess you would have, you know, but I, I'm kind of curious about the point three. Are they, how did they get in? Have they been, are they legacy when maybe Shopify said you only need four characters? I, I don't know. So I, the, when I saw this article, I kind of like scratched my head and said, what the heck's going on here? So passwords, well, we all know that passwords aren't generally very secure. The shorter you get with passwords, oh my God, it gets crazier. Uh, the, a recent study by Hive System echoes the dangers of using weak passwords. A, uh, I encourage you to go out and uh, go out to the web, do a Google search on uh, the most commonly used passwords. You'll see some obviously glaring items out there like password is used as a password. Come on, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, might be used as a password. You know, hackers are going to take that whole list of known passwords, slam them up against something like Shopify. Also, um, when hackers uh, get a password file on a system that's not secure, they'll throw it out on the dark web and charge a few cents per password for per client, or maybe the whole password file for X number of Bitcoin, except a portion of a Bitcoin, if you will. So we've got these kind of things going on in the cybersecurity world. The study examines the amount of time that would be required to brute force crack passwords of various lengths. And we talk about that in the CEH course. A five character password can be cracked instantaneously regardless of the complexity. That's why I kind of like go, what? Even if you were able to put aside the security implications associated with using a five character password, there is a potentially bigger problem of regulatory compliance. So if you look at the California Consumer Privacy Act, other types of state regulations, I'm, I'm baffled by how this is, how the CIO is handling this. I'm just baffled. It's tempting to think of regulatory compliance as sort of a thing that only large companies have to worry about. As such, many small independent sellers who open Shopify accounts may be blissfully unaware of regulatory requirements associated with doing so. Again, if you're doing business in California or in Arizona or in New Mexico, those regulatory compliance items are items that we need to adhere to. <coughs> In addition to the state regulatory compliance, which may have implications if we're doing, if we're in Arizona doing business in California, that may have implications that we have to do, do dual duty. In other words, uh, adhere to both compliance models. In addition, there's things like PCI DSS, 
there's other compliance areas that we have to look at. So even if you're a small business owner using Shopify or any other kind of like product, Square, etc., cetera, uh, you, we have to adhere to what those compliance measures are in the state and the states we're working with, as well as some more broader base uh, compliance measures like PCI DSS. We talk a bit about that in the uh, hacking uh, course, uh, as well as the Certified Ethical Hacking and Information Security courses. So uh, here is where avoiding PCI requirements with a third-party payment system. One of the nice things about using Shopify or similar e-commerce platform is that retailers do not have to operate their own payment card gateways. Uh, instead, Shopify handles the processing of tra transaction, PCI DSS. So in a way, I even as a small business owner, I would still want to be aware of PCI DSS. I may not have to implement it because I'm kind of throwing that responsibility over the wall by using uh, other providers like Shopify. For example, PCI standards requires mer merchants to protect stored cardholder data. However, when an e-commerce business outsources its payment processing, it will not typically be in the possession of the customer's card data. Makes sense. Third one down, the PCI requirement that might be more problematic, however, is the requirement to identify and authenticate access to the system components, which is requirement eight. Not going through all of PCI DSS, although the PCI security standards do not spe specifically require password length, the PCI DSS quick reference guide states on page 19, 19, every user should have a strong password for authentication. So in the standards, what we have here it's all, it's, what is that movie? We have a failure to communicate. On one side, five uh, uh, long password and minimum requirement. On the other side, under the hood, PCI DSS says uh, a strong password for authentication. What does that mean? I know it doesn't mean five. Does it mean 10 or 12? Does it mean the complexity of that? So sometimes our standards are very confusing. Start beefing up IT internally. Again, even if you're a small time organization, it's essential for you to beef up your own IT security. And even if you do pass over uh, credit card information to another organization and they're PCI DSS compliant, that's one thing I would always check. I'd check to see if Shopify is or Square, et cetera, whatever that variant is now uh, to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence on my side. I'd also make sure that my password uh, requirement, let's say if even on the web page the site that I set up, if customers are entering in their own data, I would require a, a lot more complex uh, password. Anyway, another thing that e-commerce retailers should do is uh, uh, I put this on the second bullet, is to take a serious look at what can be done to improve password security on their own networks. Again, emphasizing that point. Because sometimes if you get in a legal conflagration, if you will, it may bounce back. Even if it nicks you a little bit, it's still going to sting. Uh, the Windows operating system contains account policy settings that can control password length and complexity, and that's one of the ways. So there, we can get in the whole conversation about passwords and password lengths. This is not the form to do that, but I do want to highlight that I think Shopify kind of is weak on this. One of the most compelling capabilities offer, offered by uh, SecOps password policy is the ability to compare passwords used within an organization against a database of billions of passwords that are known to have been compromised. So again, that would be something else. And again, not going through everything on this screen. Um, due diligence is necessary. If I'm using an outside vendor, I need to make sure they're compliant. And also, uh, just because they're compliant this is a key point. Just because somebody is compliant does not mean they're secure. So if they're compliant, that, that does check off one thing. But are they secure? That's another question that really should be leveraged against a company like this as well. Shopify, good product, but it's, I think they dropped the ball. Anyway, the references are provided in the YouTube area. I will be glad to send you this PowerPoint slide. Just drop me a note. Uh, Hope you've enjoyed this. Again, you know, like, please like, please share, keep in contact, those type of normal things that we would do on YouTube. But uh, keep in mind, educational purposes, and I'm glad to share this out with you. Here's my general information. Contact me. Uh, I also post my LinkedIn address in the notes. So thank you very much for your time. Talk to you soon.